What's new in filmmaking technology this week? News, reviews, education, insights, opinions, and ideas from the Cine D Newsroom with Nina Leitner and Johnny Bahiri. This is Focus Check, the weekly Cinetech podcast. Welcome everybody to episode five of Focus Check, our Cine D podcast. Hi, Johnny. Hi, Nino. How are you? You sound like a frustrated DJ. What happened? Uh, it's my podcast voice. Oh, that's very so nice. So every week now, I try to get a cold the days before we record, and then I sound like this. Great. So it, that's your real voice. The, it's not <laughs> manipulated in any way. Well, it's the cause of getting a cold. What can I do? <laughs> All right. What are we talking about today? Let's go through the few topics. So uh, we'll actually start by talking about firmware updates, major firmware updates for Sony and Blackmagic cameras, specifically the Sony Alpha series, some of the most popular cameras in that range, and the Blackmagic Pocket cameras. Uh, we'll then move on to... Wait, wait. You're saying that what? Sony finally got some firmware updates for for popular cameras? Yeah, let's move on to this in a second. But okay. yes, it seems to be the case. We'll talk about a new lens in the Blazar range of the anamorphic lenses that I've used a lot over the last few weeks on the production, which I can also mention. Um, there's a new lens in that series. We'll talk about a wireless audio system, right? Oh, that Cinco. that yeah. you actually did an interview about it back in February at CP+, Plus, which we only published now. And um, last but not least, we'll actually go to show and talk about uh, episode feedback from last week, which was, of course, very much AI-focused. And fortunately slash unfortunately, we'll have to talk about AI again this week because there has been a huge announcement. Well, announcement. There has been announcement. Enhancements of already well, existing. Yeah, well, OpenAI <laughs> for the first time actually showed footage that was generated not by them, but by other creators that, you know, were <laughs> writing prompts and uh, making some little films and uh, that created a bit of a stir in our comment section. Sure. And uh, this and the episode feedback from last week uh, will be the end of this episode. But let's get started with the firmware updates to the major, well, the major firmware updates to the Sony cameras. So which Sony cameras? Because I'm very curious. I, I Let me guess. Finally, do we have an A7S3 firmware update? Yeah, it's A7S3. Yeah. Um, A1 and A7S3, there has been a lot of last year, actually, we reported about this. A lot of people were frustrated that mm. those cameras were left out. Uh, specifically, the A7S3 is a camera that I use a lot as a B camera and sometimes A camera. I love that camera. I mean, the A7S series in general is amazing. It's, of course, the most light-sensitive camera that, Sony has in its range. That's the S stands for sensitivity, and that's the third iteration. I think it's now already what three, four, five years old, four years old. No, it's no, no. I think it's only only three years old. But in between the the models, they're really waiting for quite a long time. I mean, I yeah. remember between the two and the three, we've been waiting. I think four years, if I'm not mistaken. No longer, I think. Even longer. And it was like, where is the A7S3? And then the A7S3. Finally came to the market, and now again, it's almost time to ask why is the A7S4? Yeah, but um, nothing there yet. But what they did do, they released the FX3 a bit later, which is, of course, in the FX line, but it's essentially the same camera in terms of, like, the guts, uh, like same sensor, um, same base sensor, dual native ISO. Uh, the second, like, the higher native ISO is 12,800 ISO, which is crazy high, so it's very, like... People you, love it, yeah. You can shoot in the dark without much noise. It's amazing. Um, but then the users of the A7S III were a little bit frustrated, including me, because I always was like, why do I need an FX3 if I have an A7S III? Because that one still has a viewfinder. But I have to admit, I think we underestimated how popular the FX3 would become. It's incredibly popular. It's also incredibly popular on rental houses. And I think it's because the way it is built, it's just like really sturdy. The whole housing, everything is much more sturdy than in the Alpha line. And that, that seems to be, uh, you know, like it's a huge taking a lot of uh, points, dots, whatever. Uh, people love the camera. Uh, the sensitivity, as you said, uh, it's, it's really amazing. We know that people love this too. The only obstacle for me as a user is the absence of 
uh, viewfinder uh, because I don't necessarily want to add a monitor on it. I don't want to drag additional batteries and so on. One day, hopefully, Sony can release a dedicated uh, viewfinder. But we're not talking about the FX3, which is very popular. We're actually talking about the uh, A7S III. We just got the, the update. So let's dive into what is this update all about. Well, they listened to users' concerns that they wanted the same functionality that the FX3 already got a couple months ago, um, or actually last year. And of course, Sony originally planned to have the FX3 as the video camera and then probably wanted to video creators to buy that camera more than the A7S III. But having this large customer base, of course, like we said, people got frustrated that bought it also for video and luckily they were listening. I mean, they literally are putting all or most of the functions that the FX3 has now into the uh, A7S III that are video specific. And uh, a major one is, of course, DCI support, like the 17 to 9 aspect ratio, which is unique to the FX line usually. Uh, I don't think there's any other alpha camera actually that has it. And um, yeah, it's the wider academy format um, of aspect ratio. Yeah, it's just a few more pixels, but at the end, it's a metro, it's a format, it's a recognized format, and and un unlike the FX six, uh, the FX three and the A seven S three are not cropping, so they are just cutting up uh, uh, off top and bottom. Um, even though it's the same sensor, but the uh, so now we have this functionality, four K DCI support. Um, and it's adding pixels. Uh, and 24p, finally. 24p, exactly. Now, to get this update, which is funny, uh, only getting the free firmware update is not enough. You need to go to the creator app, I think, and register your camera with a serial number. Then you can download something onto your like SD a license. card. There's like a license, which is, you know, sometimes we don't really know what goes on at the back end, meaning who maybe somebody kind of registered this format in some way and Sony or even the 24p, you, we, we simply don't know. It sounds yeah. funny. But it's just for people, you know, like but who are doing this update, they have to jump through an extra hoop. Exactly. You have to do register your camera with the serial number, then can right. download it uh, onto an SD card and then and, get and it And it's on. free. It's still free, but you just have to go through those extra steps talking about sd card it is now possible to for future firmware updates to finally do them through an sd card because so far i think you had to connect to USB-C, which can be a bit wonky of course what if the connection rips while you're doing the update so now you can upload in the future you can upload firmware updates to the sd card but i think you know like uh as some people have rightfully put out uh, uh really uh, there might not be another firmware update now because this camera is already not the newest anymore and now they put all the functions in there but anyway yeah um, my favorite next to what you mentioned is also literally this red uh square when you're filming now on the lcd screen you can finally see from a bit of a distance uh, that the camera is actually recording there's also lens com uh, brief uh, breathing lens compensation which is quite important and uh, there is a full connectivity now to the uh, for the to the app should we explain breathing compensation what it is please do be my guest yeah, so basically photo lenses have focused breathing um, because they're not focused on video shooting. So some photo, a lot of photo lenses actually, when you change shift focus, you will see a slight shift in, um, in the frame itself. focal length actually uh, in, in the shot. And the camera is capable to compensate for that digitally, of course, with interpolation, uh, basically by cropping in. But of course, that's a very useful thing because otherwise you need to do this in post. Yeah. Sorry, what's, what else is new? So where were we? We talked about the um, the app. Now there's a full compatibility to the Sony app. The Creators app. Creators app, which is really, really nice. And, and also the Monitor Control app, which we actually did a video about, which you can put in the show notes, I think at IBC or NEB last mm. year. Um, so uh, you can have full monitoring functions on a phone uh, connected to the to the camera, which is amazing. So even without using something like the CMO from Axoon or something like that, you can go directly to your phone and actually have monitor controls on your phone um, from uh, the camera and also control, be able to control the camera from that phone, which is very nice. And of course, I'm saying of course, but that's actually a very neat feature. There's a whole new menu look 
at the mm. end. This is quite uh, important. Well, it's uh, not the menu, so a little bit the menu, but you mean the the, the, live, the live view uh, menu, video mode display, right? Yeah, that's what um, you call it. So it's basically a new overlay for the um, presets in a way, like uh, like for what you see in live view, everything is now touch based. So you can actually actually also change aperture and shutter speed on the touch screen, which was not possible before. Um, you have to be on video mode, by the way, in order yeah. to execute this. Otherwise, in the photo mode, if you on photo mode and, sh and start the video function, this will not happen. Yeah. So you have to be on video mode. You can record video in the photo mode, but you will not not get this menu, which is a bit yeah. confusing. And last but not least, well, there's a couple more things, but um, we also have AF manual assist, and I think this was was the A7C or A7C2. The only or first camera that had this, a uh, very useful thing. So, for example, when the autofocus focuses on a face, when you have AF manual assist activated, you can actually um, kind of interfere with your autofocus because sometimes the autofocus, of course, is tracking a face, but then you need to change the focus again to an object. And uh, but the only other way of doing this was using the touch screen, which is not always very exact. Or manually switch off the autofocus on the lens and then do this, which is also, you know, like can influence your image negatively by jumping around. So with this feature, you can actually have autofocus on a face, for example, and then just use the lens barrel, uh, the focus ring and change focus and it will do that. So you can interfere with the autofocus in real time, which is extremely useful in practice, actually. Yeah. And this is completely new. I hope we haven't uh, um, uh, forgotten any any part of this firmware update. But all in all, this is a very welcomed move. And uh, I think we should also um, just note that the A1 also got some of those features. Mm, the Sony most of Alpha them. One, yeah. And a few, um, a few less actually of those features uh, go into the Alpha 9.3 and also the A7 uh, 4. Um, yeah, a few other things. There's the camera authenticity solution, which is, you know, like basically this uh, joint development foundation project where Sony is one of the members of a committee. But the the, the idea is that um, it can kind of attach a guarantee to an image or a video that it's that it's origina originated from a camera, that it's not a artificially uh, generated. created uh, image and uh, yeah that's of course very welcome that this also comes into some cameras that have been on the market for a couple of years already yeah okay but you can read all about these firmware updates on Cinedy when you watch this podcast uh, we have a very detailed uh, article on that on the site and also the black magic design uh, some of their cameras got an update what this is all about because some of the updates are really, really needed and welcomed. And the main thing is? Well, it's for all the pocket cinema cameras, 4K and 6K, not the original pocket uh, camera, which is very old now. Uh, but even the original 4K, which is also, I don't know how many years old now, but this also still gets the firmware update. And there's two major things. It's Blackmagic Cloud support. This is something we first seen with the Blackmagic camera app for iOS. Um which was announced, I think, IBC last I year, so, September. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think the first camera that had like Magic Cloud, if I'm not mistaken, was the Ursa Mini 12K or one of the Ursas, the Ursa Minis. Yeah. Um, and now we also have the cloud functionality in all of these Pocket Cinema camera, 4K and 6K, 6K G2, 6K Pro. That's the one with the NDs, uh, the G2 actually. So you can basically, while filming, if you had the capacity and a fast internet uh, connection, you can upload. It will uh, automatically upload in the background, yeah, yeah. Yes. which is without using an external device Adapter, yeah, like or uh, Atomos or anything like that. Um, and of course, a lot of updates that are connected to this um, to the cloud functionality, um, for example, uh, yeah, transfer protocol, web media manager support, network time control support, all that stuff. But there's one major other thing, which is... Finally, you can delete clips in the camera. I know it sounds really funny, but... Sounds like something <laughs> that should have been there from the start. You know, it's actually very interesting when you think about it. We can understand why... It was not uh, implemented so far. I mean, it's a 
perfect solution how not to delete clips by mistakes. But on the other hand, if you shoot something, you know it's useless and you decide to delete. It was not possible up until now, believe it or not. And now finally, you can delete clips from within the camera menu. And I think it's fair to say that it was especially frustrating with the Blackmagic cameras because many of those can record in ProRes, which generates a lot of data. <laughs> and if you're running out of space... Especially in the old days when the media was really, really exactly. uh, expensive. Yeah, And but now you, you can delete clips. Yay! Yeah, good. So that is also free uh, for download on the Blackmagic Design website. It's available now. It's a better version. And of course, yeah. uh, like always, it's a public uh, beta and feedback is always welcomed. So just to improve stuff and make things even more uh, robust and fluid. But I guess public beta means... Do that at your own risk, right? <laughs> um, I'm, I'm sure that the final version won't be long out because we know from DaVinci beta versions that usually there's not so much time between be public beta and uh, final version. So yeah. let's see. All right. Um, let's move on to some news of the week. We reported about a new lens in the from actually a company that used to be called Great Joy. Uh, at least now they use the brand Blazar and um, yeah, they have a new lens. They have a new lens. And um, just before, you know, sometimes Chinese companies tend to name themselves in such a way that we in the West don't really understand. And maybe Great Joy is, is a good example. On the other hand, we have to say that the people behind uh, the brand are really doing well, obviously, by bringing very, very affordable lenses, quality lenses. I think those blazers, you've been using them uh, more than me for the price. I think they're selling, those are anamorphic lenses, and each one is about $999, $999. It's even uh, less right now. It's $899. It's even less. For some time. Okay, wow. And um, those are, up, up until now, we will talk about the new um, edition in a second, but up until now, those, those were full-frame lenses. So if you think about the price and the lens itself, and of course it's all about the look, because at the end we know there are some modestly priced lenses, uh, anamorphic lenses in the market, but what about the look? And from what I've seen and also when I saw some of the footage that you shot, those lenses are really shining. They are really good. So before we just uh, highlight the, the what's new and we can see this here, they finally have... a. Uh, a uh, 35 millimeter, 1.6 crop, and just 1.5 uh, uh, times squeeze. One, one 1.5, sorry, one, uh, yeah. T1.6 uh, is the aperture, but those are APS-C or Super 35 lenses. Yeah, we this still, only this one though. Only this one, only this one, only the new one. Uh, we of course were asking ourselves why do they need uh, a Super 35 lens when they have actually the full frame lenses. I guess those are really aimed also in terms of like optically designed, yeah, uh, to use with uh, so many uh, Super 35 uh, cameras out there. It's a bit confusing because, uh, as you said, I've been using the three, the set of three, actually those three for quite a few months now. Uh, the older one, the one that well, came a few months ago. the existing was the yeah. 45, the 65, and the 100, and I'm shooting a full uh, cinema documentary on only those three lenses right now. And I think maybe next week we'll do an episode where we talk about lenses specifically and I can show some clips actually from that. Nice. Uh, and I, I love them. I mean, they look amazing. Um, uh, they have a very, very, yeah, a very unique look to themselves. And it's very anamorphic you know, in a way. You know, like uh, some of the budget anamorphics in the market are not so... You have to enough. work hard to make them look more anamorphic in a way. So the... Uh, because, of course, very often it has to do with only a 1.33 times uh, squeeze and so on. So it's a very slight effect. But they have a very nice circular bokeh. Um, they remind me a lot about some of the Atlas lenses, but are, of course, 10 times cheaper. That's incredible. Um, I've been using them a lot with uh, diopters as well, because the subject of the documentary that I'm shooting is dealing a lot with macro shots. Oh, wow. So Good luck. I, yeah, yeah, but the <laughs> diopters worked well, and of course you sacrifice some image quality, but it still looks great. Um, but I was surprised that they now announced a 35 mil, which is it's branded in this, it looks the same way, it's branded in the same line, Blazer Ramus, but it's the the only one that's not full frame covering. So it's super 35 and it's 35 millimeter uh, focal length, 
which is a strange choice in a way because of course if you if you use the 45 on a on a crop sensor or actually let's let's put it differently if you uh if i if i use the crop mode uh, of my camera well, just any super 35 camera with a full frame lens it's going to be very similar yeah so it's like there's not much difference it's just a little bit faster the new one um so yeah i don't i don't i don't i i would have branded it differently i think there's definitely a market to to uh, for super 35 which is the more traditional way of shooting an amorphic uh i guess but um yeah, it's it's good to have. I I definitely am missing for the for my documentary a wider. A wider. I need a wider one because we have a lot of like e even CGI stuff that needs to be put in because it's a historical architecture uh, like archaeologist documentary, um, and they are reconstructing in CGI uh, buildings from Roman times and later, and um, I have to shoot on a square. Uh, and I, I can't get a shot that's wide enough with these lenses. So we kind of, we probably have to fake it and use spherical lenses for these shots, unfortunately. Um, but the new one won't help me because it's not really wider uh, once I have the Super 35 instead of the full mm. frame. So yeah, it's it's there. Um, I think it's, it's available now. Um, yeah, it's available now. You can get the three lenses that are already in the market for only Two seven ninety nine, which is amazing. It's really amazing. I, like in terms of the quality, I'm 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 just amazed. We use the PL version, which is very flexible. I use them. I'll talk no. about it more next week. But I'm actually using them on a Sony and Panasonic lens, uh, cameras, and it's it's just very versatile nice. with an adapter. Yeah. All right, that's the the new Blazer Remus thirty five millimeter for Super thirty five, um, and. Uh, Let's move on to the last video actually you did at CP Plus back in February, which you only published now. Uh, it's about the Synco G3 Pro wireless system. What is it all about? Yeah. So first of all, Synco is like a daughter company or sister company uh, together with uh, Colbor, which is a lighting company. And this is a Chinese company. And they are just now coming up with a new wireless device. As in, as we know, that the market is really flooded with those devices. And I really try to understand why is this so unique. So first of all, they do have um, a, a similar model without the Pro label. And the one, uh, the 3G uh, Pro is still not in the market. It should come uh, during April. Um, it's kind of affordable what is the price one second i can't uh, i think it's 149 i think we put the price in the in the article but the main selling points are actually two one is the lcd screen you can really uh, touch it and you can move some stuff the second thing is those noise reduction which i personally don't use in any of those wireless system but here it's not only on off you can really control you have like three modes um, uh, to control and probably yeah, use the strength of the noise reduction. And uh, last but not least, it doesn't need a dedicated uh, a charging case. I mean, the, the main unit is the one to charge the two um, uh, senders. Yeah, so that's, uh, that's also quite nice. But all in all, what can I say? Uh, it doesn't record internally. It doesn't have any safety net when you're recording. I think you can't even record in uh, two different levels. At, or like, let's say within the device to send to the camera two different levels, also not possible. Uh, they have it in other recording devices, but yeah, this is something that we might come back in the future and maybe check this device, but it's quite amazing again to see how many companies are now producing wireless systems, all in different forms, different sizes. One of the things which, which, sorry, one of the things which is uh, uh, personally interrupting me, interrupting me, if you look at the logo or the name Synco, on the sender itself, on the microphone, I it's beyond my understanding why, especially Chinese companies, actually Rode also, I think I they actually Rode, Rode, Rode started maybe this. they started this, yeah. Uh, it, it makes zero sense when you're doing, let's say, recording somebody and you want to use the device, but you know, it's sitting here uh, just on your shirt and you have a big logo, whatever company it is, from Rode to, to Synco. You can makes, always cover the logo with your own logo. Yeah. <laughs> like we did here. <laughs> or just a black uh, gaffer tape. I'm just saying it makes zero sense. And this is contraproductive. Yeah, it's funny it's that you mentioned this actually because I saw uh, 
an, uh, something on on X on Twitter from our friend David Altizer, uh, who did a um, course on Final Cut Pro for MZ a couple years ago, and he posted exactly about that. Can we please stop? using those things in shots because sometimes well you have to admit that they succeeded in a way that you see more and more of of content creators not so much filmmakers but content creators online on instagram and everywhere just putting those road things or the dji or all, all of those me too. Me visibly don't tell anybody me too it's very convenient it's may it's very convenient you, but you know what the problem is the microphone is so much worse than even the, the than even the the cheapest level year mic the I... built-in one is horrible in comparison to all of them and there's a test online actually not from us but they they tested that and um yeah they all sound worse I don't agree with you uh, in principle. And one of the reasons that sometimes I don't, sometimes I don't use extended mic is because uh, with some of those devi devices, let's say Holyland, for example, you cannot screw on the external mic to the, uh, to the microphone, basically. Yeah. And then it can be that while you're running and gunning, let's say that I'm doing a factory tour, uh, that can actually be disattached from the from the microphone, from the original uh, uh, sender. Yeah? So then from the transmitter. And then it's a disaster because your microphone is in the pocket, for well, example. Well, not with the, I think not with a new wireless go from uh, Yeah, this, Pro, you, from, this, from this you can lock, but some, I'm, I'm using, most of the time I'm using to our factory tools, uh, the Holyland uh, device, which is, I really like the, for, for what it is, yeah, and for how much yeah, it costs. The sound quality is worse of any of the, than any of the, yeah, again, it's all a matter of, sometimes it's a matter of speed and still be within, yeah. uh, within uh, okay, quality. But, anyway, uh, but we Cinco agree G3 that Pro, it's, it's horrible that they put the logos on them. That's right. And uh, But, uh, you know, like, I mean, I understand why they do it. It's like a lot of people are using it. You see it on Instagram, it's free promotion for them. And I'm sure if you're not a filmmaker and you didn't even know that a wireless transmitter was in, in your own grasp in terms of budget... You see this on some creators reel and you're like, oh, that's interesting. You Google it and then you see, oh, it's only $200 ordered. You know, it's free ad for them. And uh, yeah, I understand why they do it, but it's still not nice. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, so this device will be uh, hopefully in the market around April and will be sold for $149. More information is in our site and please watch the video because I think it just summarizes what it's all about. All right, I think it's time to move on to episode feedback from last week. So last week, of course, we talked a lot about AI, very controversial subject, as we know. Um, we got lots of comments on YouTube and on our site, um, and I just want to dive into a few of them. First of all, um, when we talked about the royalties, we I wasn't or we weren't sure <clears throat> how Adobe is actually compensating people uh, when they use Firefly, mm -hmm. their uh, generative image, like their image generator. Um, somebody commented that, uh, that's actually Vlad, who we know well, um, commented on the YouTube video somewhere here, yeah, that they are um, compensating creators. However, they're paying cents on the dollar for images. I know because I have been approached twice, but the pay is so ridiculously low that you need to provide images in the thousands to make, say, $30 if they approved. I suppose other companies are scavenging the web for millions of images. Yeah. So um, that is, of course, crazy. So it seems like they're doing it just to say that they're doing something, yeah. which is, of course, better than nothing. Um, but uh, this is, of course, a big... Thing. Um, I guess, well, somebody else commented there should be metadata uh, connected to the images used. Uh, you know, like so w when you create an image or a video, can't there be metadata attached to where it learned from? We all don't know how those uh, things yeah. work. And that's like the real secret. They don't really share uh, what they were trained on, as we know, like when we, yeah. the video we that we showed last, last week, week, yeah, but still, yeah. it might even not be possible for them because if if there are thousands of images that one image was based on, or even millions, uh, how do you divide that up? Right, that's that's crazy. But of course, I think I also agree, and that's what a lot of people actually commented. I'm sure they can be forced to do that uh, legally uh, in in some way or another. Um, and I think still what we mentioned last week, I'm still convinced that 
if they had if they were forced to have tools that can identify that an image or video was created by a tool that they run that could change things quite quickly because then you would be able to trace where something is at least coming from um yeah but yeah. you know you're talking mostly about the western world and i guess in other regions of the world it might be with some tools will not be regulated, and then what? Well, right now the big ones are from Western companies, and yeah, of course it might a, change. It's just a matter of time. It's a matter of time, of course. Uh, but, yeah. So, um, yeah, somebody also, Eugene, agrees with you that it's too late to regulate AI and that many parts of our industry will suffer. Um, he said, it made a good point, actually. We, may, we talked a lot about documentaries because that's, you know, our background, but he also said that the last thing to be replaced will be live broadcasts and especially sports. That's very true. I mean, you cannot, I mean, you can, but it's not going to be interesting to have AI generated sports games, I guess. Um, no, no, wait, 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 one second. The sports game, not, but filming, we already know that there are a lot of uh, kind of robotic cameras that are anyway are controlling. So instead of four, five, six cameramen, eventually you will need one controller. I mean, so... Yeah, you, but that's you, a different topic. It's I, not I know, but, but but it's it, sure. But I'm just saying it's not uh, it, it's not about the filming part. I guess we discussed probably filming um, weddings, filming divorces, filming documentaries. <laughs> uh, those things are here to stay, and yeah. But I actually want to talk about the poll that we just published. And the reason that I want to talk about it, because we talk about, about the, we talked about the legal stuff and we, uh, things that we don't really have control on, but we were very interested to know what is your next move? Us as creators, as users, as professionals, what should we do? I mean, should we just sit like this and wait for the sky to fall on our head or maybe start to learn more or think about the future, how we can adapt uh, ad, uh, adapt ourselves and our profession um, to what it's, you know, what's coming. I think, and it's very interesting to see, and we will follow this poll, and please, guys, please answer let's, the... Let's go through the options, though. Maybe. Do you want to go? Okay, so... Yeah. So we try to take the, the legal stuff out of this, of course, but we still uh, want to see, like, uh, what everybody's... Um, Out, outlook is on things. Yeah, I want yeah. To, we want to know what what you us will do. I mean, it, it's it's the it's almost like the obvious. Yeah, we, we we will not be able to stop it. That's probably the next thing. Imagine I almost said the next best thing, which is of course not best. It's it's the next thing. Next will, big thing. Yeah. Yeah, big thing. We will not be able to stop it. We we have to see how to deal with this. So one option was, uh, I'm very excited about the possibilities that are coming. And I already been uh, educating myself. That's one option. I'm planning to, to learn more when the time comes. Second option, third option is I'm sitting on the, fir uh, on the fence and, um, you know, just on to see where, where it will lead. Yeah. Ex exactly. And then I don't think anything big will change. I'm not doing anything which between us, that's really probably the, not, not the way to go. And then there's the last uh, option, you know, which is... Oh, well, that's reflecting a lot of the comments, basically. I refuse to engage in this because it's all based on stolen content and AI companies will be litigated out of business. Yeah, Now, <laughs> all our options are probably not comprehensive, but that's the ones that we think that most opinions will oscillate between. And I think it's basically just interesting to see whether um, we know that our audience are 99% creators, like creative people. So, I, you know, like we all a little bit scared about that, it's fair to say. Uh, but the question is, how do you approach it? Are you also excited about the possibilities? Do you think you will find a way to wiggle through this? Are you desperate that you will be out of the job? And, um, you know, like, or do you think it will not actually be such a big problem because those companies might be out of business at some point anyway because of all the litigation that will follow? And we published the, the poll a few hours ago. The majority, I don't want to go into numbers because numbers are changing, but you can see that most of the people that voted so far are in favor of, I'm excited about the possibilities that are coming. Well, And I've already don't. been educating myself. I'm just saying this is encouraging in the sense of people are thinking. You know what I mean? It's not, they just, they don't let themselves just be um, 
but don't say a few hours ago. We literally posted this what like half an hour ago, and there's 30 votes in total. So it's a little bit too early to no, to uh, say where the the trend goes. But yeah, let's see. I mean, uh, uh, for now it's very clear. It's half of the people voted are in favor of doing something. Yeah. So uh, we can I'm, we can I'm, look at it again next week. Yeah. Uh, people will see the results anyway when they vote. We put the link to the poll in the show notes. Yeah. And now, this is leading us to the next thing, which actually, for the first time, uh, OpenAI were letting uh, creators to actually use the Sora tool and create some content. And I think it's safe to say that there was one video that captured the imagination or the attention of most of us. And it was this person with the balloon head walking around. Um, I would Personally, I was a bit surprised to see in the comments and this article that we published got a lot of comments. I was a bit surprised to see people commenting about the shape of the balloon. <laughs> no, no, I'm serious now. I'm serious because we are not talking about the technical aspect here. This is just, you know, if the shape is not so clear, that will change in the next month. This is, that has nothing to do with the ability and capability of the tool. I was really hoping that people who can see beyond the actual technical thing. Just just imagine the possibility here and what it means for our industry when somebody will just write, I want to do this and this and this, press, press enter, and here you have this um, content. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, it's, um, it's interesting because, of course, I mean, uh, we checked all those companies, individuals behind that they actually um invited and they're all legit like legitimate companies and, and 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 creative people many of them don't have huge social media presences but it's not like you know like we of course don't know what the exact why they were invited or however they it chose matter. them well it, there's always like you know like because there's been a lot of comments of people that are like oh this might be faked or whatever i don't think it is faked and I think it's all based on actual prompts and there is probably not been any post-production on top of those articles except for the fact that this specific one, of course, was put together as a short film with some music and voiceover, the voiceover likely not being AI, I don't know. Um, but um, what's interesting about this one specifically is the relative consistency um, that, of course, uh, you kind of, kind of have a character that is you know, like repeating itself, character being the balloon. I mean, the sh you see that the the individual changes a little bit in between the shots. Uh, but as you said, you know, like that's what you know. Like a lot of people are like, I'm not worried. I I I, I see that, that, and that that's true. Right now, one of the biggest problems of those generative uh, tools is that there is no consistency very often. So you ask it the same thing three times, you get completely different results. Um, but you can see that they're already working on this and, and um, tools like Midjourney and so on, the image generators are getting better and better and better, uh, that actually now it's possible to do a series and this is demonstrating that it's getting there. So I wouldn't be worried that this is something that's not going to be possible. It's only a matter of time, as you said. Um, the same, some people were criticizing, criticizing the storytelling in this uh, specific video. And again, storytelling is a very personal thing and maybe some of us would have done it completely different so and it has nothing to do with the capability of the tool well you know like I, I, I what's really probably not possible yet is having a person talk because it right now can't do any audio anyway right i mean you can't you can't generate audio yet we know that they're working on it um but if you see a person moving their mouth and saying something that's something that probably isn't really possible yet because it's not like you can say, uh, um, you know, like I want the person that is talking about this and that. Maybe they can do the correct lip movements at some point and then you put the voice on top and it will be yeah, there. But that's, yeah. but that's, you know, like anything involving live action people talking is not something it seems to be able to do right now. Uh, a lot of the things uh, we see are very fantastic videos, um, uh, photorealistic for sure. You see that humans look real, like in this video too. Um, but of course, combined with completely stuff that would have been visual effects. And, and we see in, in a lot of the user feedback and there's so many comments under this article that we've published, which are of course tapping into all of this. Um, and a lot of VFX people actually and animation people seem to be very worried now, which is understandable. 
uh, because, uh, yeah, I mean, if uh, if that is something that can just be created with a couple of words, um, that's uh, actually... Yeah, there's a whole chain. Uh, it will be a yeah. chain reaction. But, yeah, we just wanted, to, I think, to highlight this video and the article. These videos, yeah. I and mean, this is, this is also crazy. Well, there's one video which is doing, like, combinations of animals, um, uh, fantasy animals like a giraffe and a, and a flamingo, and uh, they they pretend it's like a like a nature documentary or something like this. And it looks convincing. To do something like this in CGI would be an enormous amount of work. But still, I mean, there's a couple the specific randomness about it. And one thing we don't know yet actually is how long it's taking to generate those, because we know that individual images take a while to generate. Uh, I I don't even want to think about how long it will take to generate even a full HD version of something that you don't know what you're getting. You know, like we will see when it comes out, but there will be like a preview. Um, there will probably like a low res preview of something that you can you can upscale, like it happens with many of those image generators. But it's so random that you might have to do many, many, many iterations until you get something that's usable. At which point you will like, you know, like could have could I have done this in a different way more easily? I don't know. You mean to combine a giraffe and flamingo? I'm joking. But you know, when I look at the video, actually, I only see this now on the left-hand side. It's very, I mean, we know the National Geographic logo, which is yellow. And of course, this is not a National Geographic uh, nature film, but <laughs> if you look at the writing on the left-hand side, that's what struck me immediately. It's like, even they're trying to imitate in a completely different way. But you don't listen. I mean, I, we are not playing the audio here, but it's actually the whole voiceover is like a National Geographic yeah, thing. Nice. That's the whole idea about it. Yeah, but anyway, it is it is scary. It is it is. The, but the, please look at the discussion below that article because it's a very reasonable discussion. Actually, there's a lot of people bringing up very very smart things. Um, we have a good comment from Ian. Kerr, who's uh, a Canadian, the guy behind the um, lens turret that we did two videos about. We can also show that, uh, put that link in the show notes. That's a very neat device that allows you to have three lenses at the same time on your FS7 or FX9, uh, and I think FX6 as well, and you can just swap them around. Uh, and he added some very, very thoughtful comments. And uh, basically saying that, um, yeah, uh, his, uh, his conclusion is that uh, reality-based stuff will be better protected, like we said last time, you know, like documentary sports news, and that there will be hybrid forms of storytelling that will be uh, rooted in the necessity of being in the real world. Um, I replied to that, you know, the funny thing is if if at some point all the commercial directors and creatives will be out of work, where do they go? You know, like if, if everybody, m a lot of those people might move into reality, might move into documentary. Uh, they might need a different skill set, but if you suddenly have the, you know, like, of course not Steven Spielberg, but like the Steven Spielbergs of the world suddenly be available to document to do documentary work, where does that leave the rest of us? So <laughs> that's that's the question. There's so many things we don't know yet, um, but please dive into that discussion if you're interested. It's a very thoughtful discussion, a very reasonable uh, one. Uh, and of course, a lot of people are scared, but also see a lot of them also see the opportunities. And that's what I like uh, Absolutely. about this too, is that uh, there's a very good comment from somebody called K-F-H-E-U, uh, that basically he starts off, off very negatively in a way, like seeing what happens, but he also sees um, the light at the end of the tunnel, um, you know, like uh, what what will be possible with this. And it, I think it's really, yeah, it's it's we, we can't even grasp what's around the corner yet. Yeah. And there's been one thing that we actually didn't report about, but I think we should mention it because it was also mentioned in one of the feedback comments on last week's episode. There was a company that uh, released a an entire commercial uh, that was artificially generated based on other commercials they did before. Um, and that was for the company called Under Armour. And because one of their sp Board athletes that was in the prior commercials wasn't available. They actually somehow did a did an AI version of that, and the director of that posted the commercial so online. They generated him. 
<laughs> I don't know what exactly, but it's it's like it, it says this piece combines AI video, AI photo, 3D, CGI, 2D, VFX, motion graphics, blah, blah, blah. Every AI tool was explored and pushed to the maximum, whatever that means. So it's a combination of a lot of things. There was huge outrage because uh, the director actually wrote that they did this because the artist wasn't available and they weren't able to do this in any other way in that short amount of time, which is unfortunately a sign of things to come, I guess. Uh, you can watch uh, actually the commercial on it, on his Instagram. Um, and there's a very, very good, very long article on TechCrunch about the whole thing, which is worth reading because it also talks about the pushback of all the creatives that were involved with the prior commercial and then they kind of uh, forced the director to have their credits be put on their Instagram post. Um, it's worth reading. We'll put the link in the show notes. Um, yeah, but it is uh, it is a bit of a uh, yeah saddening thing to see that um, companies and agencies are already pushing this and now actually using it as a marketing stunt. Like, hey, we're the first sure. ones to do an AI commercial without any people involved. Yeah. All right. Um, back to news. Back to news. There's one thing that we didn't mention yet. In let me just find it. Oh yeah. Tell me, Johnny. There's a something you know much more about than me. There's a new camera from Logitech of yeah. all companies. So Logitech. We know Logitech from those computer accessories that they've been making in the past. So now the company is doing a micro four thirds webcam. And it was quite interesting to see that they chose this uh, path. And in all honesty, this is a camera that can do uh, up to 4K30 recording and stream in HD, uh, up to 60 uh, frames per second. And it looks very much like a Panasonic camera, like a box camera, the BGH1, but which can do much more in a way, or different in a way. But the, and the question is, if we do, we really need such a tool and for such a price. This camera is nine hundred and ninety nine. Oh wow! For a webcam. For a webcam, yeah. Now, you know. It does it have autofocus? Um, I mean, I guess so. I guess so. I have to one second. Um, let me just before I commit on an answer, <laughs> uh, I want to quickly check. But yes, basically, it has, I mean, it has a, co a contrast uh, detect uh, uh, autofocus. But the thing is, again, it's a welcome thing to have another option. Let's call it a high quality webcam. For me, the price is questionable. And of course, with so many other tools in the market, from iPhone, uh, it doesn't have the same uh, sensor size. But let's say even the, the, the Black Magic uh, camera, which is not so much more expensive, but now can also serve as a, as a webcam. With the firmware update, yeah. Exactly. For example, yeah, and we know that a lot of the APS-C uh, cameras from different manufacturers can do something like this. The question is, if for that price, uh, we want um, a camera like this. And the thing is, I mean, if if this is already a dedicated uh, camera for streaming, one of the um, uh, input output is a USB C, and it doesn't have NDI, which means you're always um, limited on the length of cable that you can actually use. When you when you connect the camera to a know, switcher or anything else, so just just that you take this into account. Yeah, interesting. I mean, it's funny because they don't really. I can't see any Logitech customer being like, "Oh, there's a new webcam now. I can use interchangeable lenses," and uh, they'd be very confused because uh, you will have to use lenses from other manufacturers, of course, because there's no Logitech lenses, um, and then you end up with, like you said, a quite expensive webcam. Setup. Again, maybe the, this is for those who already have micro four third lenses and maybe from whatever reason they think this tool is more suitable uh, to work than, let's say, with the Panasonic um, GH series of cameras that they have. But one thing that I learned in the, in, the, in the few years that I'm dealing with equipment, sometimes you just can't... Well, maybe it's not really... I mean, on, on, on Black Magic, uh, on, on b and it actually says mirrorless streaming camera. I mean, I guess they want to... Like, it seems more like they want to enter the streaming market than... No, it, it is, a st of course, but that's the, that's the main thing. Why would you buy something like this for streaming? That's the thing. I'm not... This is not a camera that we will use for anything. But there is a Black Magic design one, right? The very similar one, which... Uh, what is it called? 
maybe you know Alex because you're the you're the expert for Black Magic the Studio something. Let me yeah, actually look for it. Black Magic Studio. Yeah, it's even also it's a square camera, it's a box camera. Yeah, there we go. Design micro studio camera, also nine ninety five dollars. So that's for clearly the competitor. And what is yeah. the the mount here? Also it's, micro for I think it's also mic micro for yeah. thirds. Yeah, same thing. Yeah, yeah. active micro. For so it's a competitor to that. Okay. Now, if you look, if you look at the B and H side, it says number one seller. That means this Which is category? a category. Yeah. For for that category, for so obviously it's an interesting camera for. For some people, and I guess, f uh, let's. I think let we just found the answer why the why Logitech is making one. <laughs> exactly, and I think it will be also interesting to follow up in a few months and see how this uh, camera doing when it's in the market. But I'm just saying, like, why would you use the Logitech one if you have the Black Magic? Because Black Magic is so well integrated with all the their switches and um, all the hardware they and software that they have. The only thing that I can think of, and I also uh, learned it only by. By working in our industry, there are some people who are very dedicated to a certain brand. There are probably people out there, not from our filmmaking niche, who literally love and trust Logitech. Because wait, they have wait. a mouse? Or because that? they have a keyboard. It doesn't matter. I mean, the reason doesn't matter. I mean, that's why you see sometimes, I'll give an example. Yeah, Even Manfrotto is doing some CF Express card and you ask yourself, why why Manfrotto? Why people will buy a Manfrotto CF Express they card? The they know the brand, mm -hmm. and if they trust the brand, that's what they want. So I guess that's one of the, uh, of the reasons to come up with such a camera. The only thing is, and this is really somewhere here at the back of my brain, when I was in Japan uh, in uh, Nov in February, I actually saw this camera, the Logitech. Well, that's the thing, and I ca I can't remember if it was branded Logitech. Or something else. It was a Chinese company showing me that camera mm. for streaming with the micro four thirds uh, mount, and I was literally standing there thinking if I should interview the young lady who showed me the camera. And I was like, you know, this is not really for our core audience. I'll skip it and kill me. But I can't remember the brand name, and I, I don't, I can't remember if she said she is Logitech or if, or if it was just. Well, maybe it's uh, the OEM manufacturer I for know, I don't. I don't know. That's why I'm very careful with my wording here, and I yeah. want to give uh, Logitech, Logitech the, the, the credit uh, for for that camera. And by the way, uh, also the name that they chose, uh, like Mevo, we have another, it's very Mevo, similar. Mevo, yeah. Yeah, to a, another Chinese manufacturer who is actually making very nice uh, filmmaking tools or cameras. But yeah, let's see what this is going to take. I guess we will not do a lab test of this one, though. Not this one, thank you. <laughs> and actually, um, yeah, I mean, we were asked by Logitech if we want to uh, review this camera, and we say, no, thank you, but we'll be very happy if you do a, 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 a dedicated model for filmmaking or cinema, we'll be very happy to review Well, I think it. it's fair to say, like, we don't really do that much streaming content, so yeah. um, that's why. But of course, this could be a very interesting uh, thing to compare yeah. to the Blackmagic option and also the Panasonic option. All right. Um, I think uh, anything else we want to mention here this week, or no? I think we covered it all. I I think we should really thank the guys for following us and writing comments and yes. downloading the the podcast and listening. It's a very good start for us. We're very happy to try and engage like this with the community. Um, yeah. And yeah, much more to come. One one more thing, which is we are a little bit you know, what two two weeks, two and a half weeks, three weeks before NAB. I just want to really ask or say, guys, please stay tuned. That's going to be an extremely interesting show. So much is coming. And especially when we are talking about all those AI and because in one way, we're kind of concerned if that's going to take any work from us. On the other hand, we know that um, manufacturers in general are going to bring so much nice equipment, something that we can work with and do even more magic in our craft. I think it's really worth uh, noting this and just yeah stay tuned we're gonna have a, a lot of fun a lot of uh, great time together doing NEB we know for a fact that it's gonna be an NEB worth waiting for absolutely right? yeah and as Johnny said please you know like we're we're you know like we have a decently sized YouTube channel we're very happy about every viewer but we're really new on all those podcasting platforms like Spotify Apple Podcasts and so on if you want to really help us share this episode with your friends and colleagues, if you found it interesting, or even any of the other episodes, 
please uh, um, subscribe to our podcast on one or more of those channels. It would really help us in the future. Uh, we want to keep this going every week. I think it's a very nice format to tie our uh, YouTube and also, you know, like uh, audio audience to our website more and have a little bit of a background discussion. I, I really like the format. And it's also good for us, for us to actually, uh, you know, like think about what happened over a full week because we're just so inundated with news and and stuff Reviews every, every and week. That. And it's good to to kind of step back a little bit and get this overview. So we really like the format and I hope you all agree. So please share with friends and colleagues and see and hear you next week. Thank you. See you next week. Bye.